My name is Mark Zisman. I come from Lincoln Laboratory, which is the largest laboratory at MIT. We're a research, uh, federally funded research development center with uh, several thousand people. And one of the things that we look at very carefully is, is and, and that we research is cybersecurity, uh, mostly from a Department of Defense intelligence community perspective. And really, what, what cybersecurity is, at least from the way, way we look at it, is it's all about providing enough confidentiality, integrity, and availability to get, your, to, to get the, the enterprise mission completed, right? We don't need perfect security. What we need is enough security to, uh, to be able to get our missions, our missions completed. And so what does that mean? So, so confidentiality means we don't want the adversary stealing our data uh, any more than we can tolerate. Integrity means that we don't want the adversary to be changing our data, to be distorting it uh, uh, for, for us. And we also, we want availability. We want to make sure that they're not destroying the data or e even making it temporarily unavailable to us and to the, and to the uh, other stakeholders that we have. So let me, what I'm going to do is take a little bit of a threat perspective uh, on this. And then what the rest of the panel is going to do is describe some uh, new techniques, a little bit like what, uh, what, what Stephen talked about. Some of them will be uh, similar to what he talked about as to how we can, prob uh, how we can possibly thwart the adversary. So what, I've, what you're seeing here is a, uh, is a pyramid. Uh, this uh, uh, one view of the threat. This comes from the Defense Science Board, a de recent Defense Science Board study. It's online. You can, you can read the whole study. But it basically thinks of threats in terms of three tiers, kind of the low-end threat, the mid-level mid threat, and then the high-end threat. And so what are the differences between these different threat actors, these different adversaries? The folks down at the bottom only have the capability for exploiting uh, vulnerabilities that, uh, that, that are already known, right? So if somebody knows there's a vulnerability, maybe there's some uh, attack, there's some malware out there, they can take advantage of it, and they can, they can take that, tailor it a little bit, and run it, uh, and, uh, and do some damage to systems. The mid-level threat, what those folks can do is find new vulnerabilities in systems, okay? They're capable of finding those, finding and creating these, uh, these zero-day attacks, for which at the moment, at the moment they use them, there won't be any, uh, any perfect defense. The folks at the top, maybe the nation states, these folks can create vulnerabilities in systems, okay? So these are, these are the most highly uh, capable and, and best funded uh, folks. So, so what, what can you do? What can, a, what can a firm, what can an enterprise do to thwart these different kinds of adversaries? The folks at the bottom can be thwarted with good, what we would call good hygiene, right? Good patching, good training of staff. Uh, to make sure that people understand how to, uh, how to, how to combat uh, social engineering and so on. The people, uh, people in the middle, the folks who are, uh, who, for, folks are in, the uh, in the middle, maybe it's the next, some of the next generation security techniques. What Stephen talked about, what our folks uh, up here will talk about, you have a shot at, uh, at, comb at combating those folks. The folks at the top, there is, no, there is nothing you can do as an enterprise to thwart, to thwart that type of adversary. That adversary can only be thwarted through deterrence, and that's something that needs to be done at a national, international level. So based on that, what, what can a, a CISO that works for one of your companies really do? If he does the hygiene at the bottom, uh, if, he, if, he, if he's making sure the patches are done, the, the training's happening, he's using best commercial tools that, that might be available, um, you, can, you can stop those folks at the bottom, but the other thing you do is you increase the workload of the middle and higher tier. The people at the top are stingy, right? They will use the easiest possible way to get into your systems. So by providing hygiene, uh, better hygiene, you make it harder for them, and by doing that, maybe they'll go and attack somebody else and leave, and, and leave you alone. So it's a, it's, it's a good idea. The, the, the cyber defense, then, uh, really rests on three things, on protection, detection, and reaction. We just heard a keynote talk that was focusing primarily uh, on detection. What our folks here are going to talk about uh, in, the, in the coming minutes are, are some of the next generation approaches both for, uh, all, all, for all three of those things, protection, detection, reaction. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, general weaknesses, and this is a kind of a, a general assessment of security and not meant to, don't take it as calling anybody out specifically. I don't want to get into any of that. But generally speaking, the reality is there are only two phases of security response. You've got the first one and the next one trying to fix everything, and that's really all that's going on. Unfortunately, that is a really poor way to win a war. And Perhaps even worse than that, those psychological responses are so powerful that they inform the purchasing decisions that happen at companies. Those purchasing decisions obviously inform the security markets, and so what we end up with is we end up with tools that also aren't set up and designed to win the entire war. They're designed to alleviate two psychological components of it. So what do we need to do? We need to take a step back. 
we need to start thinking about things strategically as if we were embroiled in a war, because frankly, <laughs> you are. There are about five rough components to winning. What we need to do is we need to first control the attack surface. We need to transition from, oh my gosh, to more of a ready to go stance, both in psychology, but also just as a general recognition that we cannot prevent 100%, but we can know of 100%. The next thing we need to do is hunt attackers. Right now, security personnel, they stare at screens, they watch tripwires, because that's all they can do. We need to step back, we need to take some time and some resources and build some teams that are able to go and actively hunt for these guys. Looking through logs, you know, in, interfacing with you know, different systems, components, but also with the people of the organization. Because as was mentioned, anywhere you find a weakness in the general security posture, that's where you're gonna find the attacker, because they're lazy. They do only what they need to. Once you've discovered them, you need a strategic response. Right now, our responses tend to be patch that vulnerability, wipe these systems, let's move forward, go, go, go. Any kind of significant attack affects the entire company. Any kind of strategic response requires the entire company to respond. Everybody from HR, marketing, all the way down to procurement, if everyone responds in a strategic manner, you can actually turn one of these from all out devastation to an opportunity. Prove how resilient you are, to prove what you're doing in the marketplace. The after action review, likewise, is generally focused solely in security. What do we do wrong? How can we do it better? It needs to be an entire organization event. Every piece of the organization should be required to help to answer who are they, who were they, what were they after, why did they come after us, and most importantly, where and how did we fail? And those three things become the foundation of quality threat intelligence. And that threat intelligence can then be used by your security team to improve the other stages, creating a positive feedback loop. And with a, this feedback loop, with these strategic concepts and these goals, I do believe we can win this. We can win this war. With that, go ahead. Thanks, Rob. Um, so I think I want to talk a little bit about not necessarily what um, security is needed perhaps again today, what the enterprises are evolving towards. I think the signs are, are kind of clear from the previous panel discussions and, and uh, it's obvious <coughs> that you know, the cloud applications is kind of more and more, the world is actually going towards and uh, according the employees are going towards using more and more mobile devices or any device uh, and, and the service may be hosted as a cloud service by, by somebody else. Perhaps, you know, in very near future, we will see uh, their enterprise is not just your, your own perimeter, even if it's a large organization that employees want to use what they want to use because they really have to be productive and competitive and, and be efficient uh, as compared to, you know, their competitors in the market. So what I call is more like an what does the security look like for the elastic enterprise? And what is elastic enterprise? Elastic enterprise is not just only that you're using the best you know, elastic computer or elastic storage and all, but actually what kind of resources an enterprise uh, can uh, uh, provide to its employees and how they can work in, in, a, in a fashion uh, where you know, and they can use any best productivity tools that are, that are available. So if you look at in this, in this slide that you know, today's SecOps, uh, the way it looks is that they have their own perimeter, and as Stephen was saying that, you know, the SIMs can actually uh, monitor logs from coming from all the firewall devices as well as all the uh, in-house applications, although even the window is small. But the reality is most, a lot of business is not going to be done within this perimeter uh, at all. Uh, in fact, more and more, and, you know, as new generation comes along, more and more businesses would be look like, looking like, I have a device. I'm, you know, I'm anywhere, I mean, I'm going straight up to a, a cloud-based service somewhere, and the current SOC that exists today, they have no visibility, and, no, uh, and because there's no visibility, accordingly, there is no controls, we don't know whether how much compliant these services are, we don't know what risks are there, we don't know whether our, we, uh, we actually have any governance. So the, the security as the way it's gonna perhaps look like is that we need to understand 
all the transactions that may be happening from these devices going to the cloud applications. We do need to enable our employees to be productive and efficient and all, but we need to create some kind of a safety net around their productivity tools and then maybe correlate all, bring it back, as Steve also mentioned, that it is not going to be point solutions that I have you know, some MDM here or I have you know, some proxy sitting somewhere. You have to correlate, bring all that data, understand very granular transactions going on on these cloud services, and then correlate it with uh, to find where exactly these threats may be. Or if you find there is a, there is a threat you know, or th that has been discovered, what is the actually history behind it? Um, so I think that's, that's so there's the question, there's a, these uh, blind spots in the SecOps is going, is going to go bigger and bigger as this uh, organization starts looking like it. And a new security model, uh, very much similar to what Steve has mentioned, is needed for the Elastic Enterprise, uh, which is your resources, your people, your services, your devices, or anywhere. It's not just in the perimeter. Go figure you know, what kind of uh, security is going to be needed. And data science, in, in, in my view, is going to play the, a big role uh, in actually solving, solving that problem. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Junaid Islam. I work for a small company called Vitter, and we provide security solutions to the, I would say, the top 0.1% of both the uh, Fortune 500s as well as the US government. So uh, a couple of things I should say about, uh, before I make my comments, that'll provide some context. First, uh, I've never been to this event, so Bashir called, pulled me over, and he said, Junaid, it's really important to be honest. This is not a sales meeting or anything like that. So that's good. So, <laughs> so I want to be direct. The, the uh, other important thing is, uh, as a, just to get, in the spirit of honesty, uh, uh, Rob used to work with an intelligence agency that has the exact opposite perspective of an intelligence agency that I sometimes have friends with. So in the spirit of honesty, instead of having a panel where everybody says the same thing, I want to give you my honest perspective. And we can think of what happened at Rob's old place. Uh, I don't know if he'll talk about that. It's but the NSA. <laughs> I don't know if anybody got that. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously, I don't work for the NSA. So uh, on that slide there, I, I started building a matrix of all of the security co uh, controls that go into a company. And the, the reason I stopped at 30 is my hands got tired of typing this out. So the, and that's why there's not more than 30, but the average Fortune 500 has easily 40 categories of products of which there might be hundreds of vendors. So just to be frankly honest, this is just unworkable. I mean, you've got intrusion detection, intrusion management, logging, and, and I fully respect the, the keynote, but those bring even more systems. It's not like they eliminate systems. So I, I really think, and, and this is just not, not me personally, there's a lot of people in the government side who are working on all of these issues who feel that the architecture is fundamentally uh, broken and flawed at its core level. The complexity of managing these systems is too high. The, the value is too little. It's too easy for directed attackers to, uh, Mark's point, to learn about these systems and thus breach them. So the, the question is what, what to do? So I'm just going to give you one perspective. This is not the only perspective. There's many uh, teams in R&D on, on the intelligence side. We're just one of many teams. But the, the approach that we're taking, and I, and I believe in this, is you know, uh, cloud computing has matured, and we've seen all these tools, right? And we, we, the whole morning was focused on that. Well, you, we could take these tools and repurpose them and create effectively not software-defined networks, but software-defined perimeters, that is, using exactly the same tools. And there's a lot of things that make it easy. There's Diffie-Hellman ephemeral, for if those guys who, that allow you to generate private keys at both points. Uh, th this is all public domain stuff. So one of the areas that people are heading, and, and I believe this, is why don't we take a network like this and actually break it virtually into very tiny networks that are all role-based. Using existing, you know, we don't have to invent something. And the idea is when there is an insider attack or breach, which is my little anonymous guy, he can only get to what he's allowed to see versus being able to breach the entire network. So this is a, a new area where the intelligence agencies, not, not that one, the other ones, uh, are focusing uh, because fundamentally we believe that uh, uh, behavior-based profiling is, is flawed. And I know that's a part of a different discussion, 
I finally don't believe that analytics or logging will work because all you're doing is you're educating the attacker. And what's even worse with the Snowden thing, everything is public. So all of the logging data around the system on a global basis is going dark very fast. So anyway, that's kind of my perspective and uh, my time's up and I'll pass it on to Mr. Kent. Thank you. I'm with a little company as well named Cisco Systems. And um, I support the public sector, so it is uh, federal as well as state, local, and education. Uh, we spent in the U.S. public sector about $10 billion last year on cybersecurity, and if you expand that out to commercial enterprises, probably over $20 billion in the United States spent on cybersecurity. So the question is, how are we doing? Uh, according to the GAO and the federal government, about 59% of organizations believe they've been attacked in the past year. Our own analysis has shown that 100% of the business networks we analyzed have traffic going to websites that host malware. Basically, it's not about if, it's about when, right? Now, if it's when, how's that, how are we doing about mitigating that malware? malware? Well, according to Mandiant, the average day to uh, detect APT threat went from 416 days three years ago down to 300 days, so that's really good. Uh, on the uh, commercial side, I think we're finding roughly around 32 days, so a month that malware sits on the network before it's detected. So I think it is all about how do we identify the malware before it gets to its target, before it's doing what it wants to do. And if you look at types of malware, um, they all have similar tracks. Uh, but before I go there, I want to talk about the, the bigger issue, the, the surface, the attack surface is growing. Obviously, we have cloud, we have mobility. We're putting iPads and mobile devices on there. And that's just phase one. Phase two is about the internet of everything, right? It's about sensors. It's about refrigerators, Coke machines connecting to the internet. Anybody here on December 23rd, the first refrigerator part of a botnet happened? Mm -hmm. See that? Well, as we put more and more devices on the network, obviously, they're going to be susceptible to the same threats. So. Um, to quote Huggy this morning, the, uh, we have to fix our broken windows here. And it does start with visibility. And I think that's where I want to focus is it's about visibility. Now, clearly, it's hard to get visibility, but there's a whole lot of basic hygiene that we can do to help us with the visibility. And then there's these devices and tools that we can use for visibility. You mentioned some. Stephen mentioned about what, what his vision was. And some of that vision is here today. Clearly, the whole thing's not there. But there's one of the biggest opportunities for us to get visibility that we've really haven't seen used across most of our customer base is the value of the network. Uh, everything that comes on the network has to touch the network. So therefore, if you have some sensors built into the system, into the, every network device, you have a great visibility tool. It uh, doesn't mean it's the only visibility tool out there. We're going to certainly use host-based tools as well. Uh, but as you see more and more devices connecting to the <coughs> network, you can't have host-based systems when the interface is a, a 20K file for that refrigerator or that uh, video surveillance system. So really it's about how we can have visibility to attack the, the attack before it meets its mission. And we can do that if we start with hygiene and getting visibility of what's on the network. And, and I, I don't say that lightly. Most of my customers in public sector, if I ask them, do you know what's on your network, they will say no. And that's before we get to the Internet of Things. So a clear focus on what's on the network being able to do that in an automated fashion, being able to have reputation-based connections, whether it's over the web or whether it's within the system, so you can address that internal insider threat, internal reputation-based systems, can be done if you have visibility and if you have a, a sensor base that is your network.